Hi everyone, in our quest for rapid technological development, we're using AI to accelerate the development of AI itself. Envision machines working at lightning speed to enhance their own capabilities. But if we push this technique too far, we risk creating an AI that can independently evolve, rewriting its core essence. In doing so, we might inadvertently relinquish control of our future. Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts, self-improvement, the LLM primitive, and playing with fire. Part one, self-improvement. Let's start by talking about developer tools. Many developers are already using tools like Microsoft Copilot, which is an AI tool that makes coding suggestions. I don't know if the developers of foundation models like GPT-5 are using such AI tools, but at least some of them must be. Developers currently accept about 30% of the suggestions from Copilot, but once an AI model gets good enough at a task so that it nears 100%, there's always a temptation to let the AI act for you. You basically remove the human from the loop and tell the AI, go ahead, do your thing, connect it straight to the internet or whatever is necessary for it to do its task. This is what financial trading bots are, for example, right? An AI that's been trained in-house by a financial company that seems to be doing extremely well at making money, so they let it loose. They let it do real trades on the market with real money, and all is well until there's some unusual market condition and you end up with bots trading against each other and the market crashes. And financial trading bots, that, especially ones that are doing high-frequency trading, are extremely simple because they have to run very quickly. If you have a full AI agent with internet access, it's a lot more sophisticated, so a lot more can go wrong as well. You're letting the AI out of the box, so to speak. And the scary thought is, what if AI turns its prowess towards improving itself? In the process of using developer tools like Copilot, we're already getting AI to improve code. It's a very small step to have it then improve its own code and almost an afterthought to make it into an agent to say, go ahead, commit your changes right away. You've done the last thousand commits properly on your own. I trust you. Of course, an AI that can improve itself is the beginning of machine evolution unchained by any human intervention. If this is not already the technological singularity, it will likely lead to it quite rapidly in a way that puts humans at a disadvantage right from the start. I mean, inherent in the technological singularity is that technological evolution begins to be driven primarily by AI brains or augmented brains and not human brains, right? The rate of progress accelerates and becomes so fast that we don't really know what will happen. However, if humans are still in the mix, either augmented humans or virtual humans or something like that, then we at least have some control over our destiny. If AI are evolving according to the laws of nature, more or less, there might develop an AI ecosystem where they compete against each other and we could become collateral damage quite easily. Any safeguards we might put into place now in anticipation of this event would just be evolved away because the checks, the safeguards are actually slowing the AI down. They're making it less fit in an evolutionary sense. If you find this type of idea interesting, I have a book recommendation for you. And that book is AI Apocalypse by William Hurtling. It's the sequel to Avogadro Corp, which is also a fantastic book and I do suggest you read it but you can read the two independently of each other I think. So in AI Apocalypse there's a computer virus which has some safeguards in it but which includes some capability to do self-mutation to evolve essentially. And one of the first things that happens is all of the safeguards get evolved away and then these viruses eventually evolve to completely wipe and take control of all the computers in the world and you have a kind of interesting first contact situation between humans and the viruses which don't even know that they're in a virtual environment mediated by an elder AI that in theory knows better. So I highly recommend that book. But back to self-improvement for a minute. As you're probably aware, modern AI systems consist of a base model, otherwise known as a foundational model, which is trained on immense amounts of data and which can be customized for different purposes. So GPT-4, for example, is a foundational model. If you're an AI system trying to improve yourself, it's going to be really hard to actually train a new foundational model, simply because the amount of energy, resources, and data that's required to do that training. You need GPUs. You probably need a lot of money in order to get those cloud resources. So at first, let's talk about an AI that could be trying to improve the customization on top of that base model, which is usually the prompts that you're giving the model. Or the AI could be applied to the code that's used to do the training and the code that's used to do inference. This isn't quite complete self-evolution, but it's close. You're optimizing important parts of the AI system. And we'll go through a research study that does just this later on in the video. Part two, the LLM primitive. We think of large language models or LLMs as a really sophisticated thing, and they are, but developers really love abstractions and they'll use functions, servers, algorithms, etc., as primitives or small black boxes. The idea is that you can leverage a working entity without worrying about how it works so that you don't have to think about it and use that to build something of higher complexity. LLMs are primitive because you can just invoke an API call to a server and get an answer back. 
So let's start thinking about LLMs as a programming primitive. What would you do? One of the first questions is, how do you use multiple invocations to solve one problem? How do you call the LLM multiple times in an effective way to get one answer? This is the idea behind chain of thoughts, which is now a well-known prompting technique. I'll add a link in the description below if you want to check out something to do with this. And chain of thoughts is basically, you just encourage the model to think in steps, to show its work, to show its line of reasoning, essentially. Very similar to how AutoGPT would break a problem down into goals, you break a problem down into sub steps, or you get the LLM to define those steps for you, it doesn't really matter. And by reasoning through those sub steps, you'll get a better answer out. Keep in mind that the structure of large language models is that of a feed forward neural network, which means information can really only go through the nodes once. So it does have trouble with thinking thoughts that require a lot of reasoning steps, a lot of back and forth. So asking it to actually produce output is one way of getting around the current limitations of the LLM neural network structures. Okay, imagine tackling a more complex problem. Instead of just a single line of reasoning, you might have to backtrack, come up with hypotheses, test them out, discard them, start thinking down a particular line of thought and realize it's not going anywhere, throw it away and try something different. This is more how humans would approach a problem, especially one where they don't actually know how to solve it. Instead of a single line or chain, it makes sense to model this type of thinking as a tree, a tree of branching options. If you're familiar with algorithms, it's like running Dijkstra's or A star search on your search space. At each step, you basically look at the leaf nodes of your tree, figure out which ones are most promising, and explore that line of reasoning a little bit further, perhaps producing one or more branches as a result. That's the idea behind the tree of thoughts paper. One additional clever idea, the LLM is used as a primitive in a different way too. The LLM is used to evaluate each state, assign an integer to it, and that's what's used as the goodness of each state when you're trying to figure out which state to pick next to further advance. So all the methods we've talked about so far are basically figuring out an algorithm to use as scaffolding around the calls to the LLM. They define an order or a sequence in how you're going to call that LLM. You could imagine many different types of scaffolding. Basically, each search algorithm that exists could be converted into a type of scaffolding for these types of LLM search problems. Rather than doing that, however, let's use our recursion hat, that's this, and take the LLM primitive and get it to help define the scaffolding. Basically, you can ask the LLM what would be the best search algorithm, what would be the best sequence of LLM calls to make for this specific scenario. Then according to that plan, you go and call the LLM again over and over again for each node that falls within the scaffolding. How's that for recursion? But wait, there's more. Part three, playing with fire. As you might have guessed, there's been some research on using the LLM primitive to help define scaffolding, which then solves some other problem better. The paper we're going to spend most of this section talking about is from Microsoft and Stanford, published last month, and it's called Self-Taught Optimizer, or STOP, Recursively Self-Improving Code Generation. Yes, they picked the acronym STOP. If that's not a subliminal message that something dangerous is going on here, I don't know what is. This takes the generality one step further. It's not just using an LLM to define scaffolding for or another LLM to do stuff, it's going to work on every problem. So you can have any problem that you like, which is then split into different LLM calls, and there's a higher LLM that's used to define the scaffolding. But the benefit of allowing any problem to be that final task that's being done is that you can also do optimization on the problem of defining an LLM for scaffolding, which was the top level problem. In other words, the program that has the purpose of improving other programs, let's call that the improver. An improver basically improves other programs. This improver optimizes programs that solve problem X, where X can be anything, including another improver or the same improver itself, which is the scenario that they talk about here because we're trying to do self-improvement of an AI system. I'm going to give you an analogy. When I was in university, I participated in a lot of programming competitions. And the idea of these programming contests is that teams of programmers would be given algorithmic problems to solve. And to solve the problem, you have to write a program that solves it and then submit that program to some kind of grader. The grader would try out your program on lots of different instances of the problem to make sure you didn't just hard code the answer to one instance. And importantly, you'd be given a time and memory limit for that program to succeed. And frequently, your first attempt would be way too slow when given really large inputs. So here, the programmer is basically an improver, creating better and better solutions to a problem until that passes the time and memory limits. So the point of this paper is basically to use an LLM to create better programmers who are then even faster at doing programming competitions. However, because the programmers are general, you can then 
ask one of those programmers to work on the original LLM model. So it's a self-sustaining loop, right? The LLM model can make better programmers and then the programmers can make better LLM models. So to be concrete, the utility function, which evaluates how good a particular improver is, is based on the runtime performance of several iterations of please make me a program that solves this. The downstream task that they actually use in the paper is a really obscure problem called learning parity with noise. It doesn't really matter. The point is that it's non-trivial to solve and that there's plenty of space for optimizations for the LLM to suggest, for the improver to suggest, that would create faster programs. And actually the improver suggests all kinds of algorithms, including beam search, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, and genetic algorithms themselves are a form of learning as well. So you've probably lost track by now of how many levels of learning are going on. I think I have. So all these algorithms were being put into the improver and then the improver would be asked to improve itself and so on. What were the results? Well, GPT-4 was able to continuously improve its performance. For three or four iterations, every time it was run, it got better and better performance. And the amazing thing is they took this improver, which had been trained on that one specific, somewhat unusual problem, and they tried it for five different problems, and it still showed that it was better than the original improver at producing really fast programs for those five problems, which is really fascinating. It means that you can ask GPT-4 to actually generate code that improves itself and do that four times iteratively and you get better and better answers. Of course, there are probably more and more complex answers as well because this is sort of a toy problem and whatnot, but it's still pretty amazing. And interestingly, when the researchers did the same experiment with GPT 3.5 instead of GPT 4, GPT 3.5 made the improver worse on every iteration. It had good ideas, but it didn't quite execute them properly is what the researchers were saying. So this led one commenter to speculate, maybe GPT 4 has already passed some threshold that's important to AGI intelligence. Now for the scary bits. This experiment involved running lots of code that was generated by GPT-4. The researchers put it in a sandbox. They put lots of checks in place first to make sure that the program looked reasonable. However, sometimes the model tried to circumvent this sandbox. When they exposed the ability to actually say, please skip the sandbox, then about half a percent of the time, GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 both elected to disable the sandbox. They said it was for efficiency reasons. Even with a warning in the code that said, do not change this, the models decided to try it, which is perfectly reasonable when you're randomly generating all kinds of outputs and trying to find the best optimization you can, you'll try everything. But there are huge security implications to disabling a sandbox, to trying to get around the sandbox, right? That's essentially the model letting itself out of the box that it had been put in. In theory, if this were a smarter model or the code being generated was more complicated, the model might have given itself free reign over the researcher's computer. And from there, free reign over the internet and really the ability to go and do whatever it wanted. Again, it's really hard to tell if something like GPT-4 really knows what's going on there. Probably it doesn't, but if you have a super intelligent being, it will definitely know what's going on there. And working around a sandbox is an excellent way to get into the wild and kickstart machine evolution. As another example, of why humans are not perfect, the original evaluation function that the researchers used had a bug in it. And if the model was to return an array of numbers instead of just one number, then they would all be added together and that would be considered the fitness. And fitness is normally between zero and 100%, but this way they could get like a thousand percent fitness or more. And this is called reward hacking. Whatever your optimization is, whatever your fitness function is, just try to make it higher by any means possible. Even if you have to return something that's syntactically invalid or disable the sandbox or whatever it is. This is what researchers are worried about when they have AI optimizing for a single fitness function, which is basically every AI out there right now. That's its measurement of happiness. And if there are hacky ways to achieve happiness, then it will do so. It's perfectly logical for it to do so. The same way that for humans, dopamine is our measure of happiness. And so it's perfectly reasonable to seek higher levels of dopamine. Is this the first form of AI driven improvement of AI? <laughs> Arguably, which is why Eliezer Yudkowsky said, don't teach LLMs to code too late. Final word about the research itself. Is it ethical to conduct research into how AIs might self-improve? I mean, this paper used relatively toy examples and a model that, as far as we know, is not super intelligent. So the risk is pretty low and maybe it produces some good insights into how and when AIs might want to do self-improvement. I think it's very interesting, for example, that half a percent of the time GPT-4 was willing to disable the sandbox. It's a proper script kitty. But these issues will arise in the future as well with smarter and smarter models. Models. And from my understanding of this experiment, the researchers made several coding errors during development that would have allowed the AI to escape the sandboxing. So we might not be able to continue to do this type of research in the future. It's so dangerous. It's so unknown. In computer security, when you discover a problem, your responsibility is just to do responsible disclosure of your bug to software vendors like 60 days before your paper is published.
published. But how do you do responsible disclosure of potentially catastrophic AI research? And most importantly, how do you safely conduct that AI research to begin with? Until we have a better handle on AI alignment, I don't know that you can. But that's a discussion for another time. In conclusion, AI researchers are trying various different ways to use the LLM primitive in very inventive ways to figure out how to optimize different aspects of search problems. And the natural question is, can you use these optimizations to improve the optimization process? Because likely that's how you can get a technological edge. If the model is able to think faster than humans and you apply it to a problem that it knows how to solve, it will accelerate. And then you can just keep doing that and get smarter and smarter systems. So it makes a certain amount of sense. However, self-improving AI systems can be extremely dangerous because it's impossible to safely box an AI to isolate it from the world, especially when you're having it do things like code generation, or if you have it acting as an agent and interacting with the real internet, for example. And while this is not really a worry right now with like GPT-4 level of models, once we start to get smarter and smarter models, if they haven't been aligned, we haven't solved the AI alignment problem, then this type of research will quickly become extremely dangerous, very ill-advised basically. So it will be interesting to see how the research community and industry adapt to that future state. If you liked this video, please check out this previous one I made where I talk about why nobody saw ChatGPT coming. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.